<laughs> okay. Over to you, Kenny. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kenny Frederick. I've come from uh, George Green's in the Isle of Dogs down the road. I've been in post for 17 years, and I'm retiring this year. So I thought I'd tell you all the truth now about <laughs> headship. Um, and my aim really is to encourage those of you who sometimes think perhaps I couldn't be ahead. Of course you can, because if I can be ahead, anybody can. But the title of my talk really is how to keep calm and carry on when all hell is breaking loose. Because in my 17 years, a lot of hell has broken loose. And I'm still standing, I'm still employed, and I'm you know, retiring, haven't been sacked yet. So I just really want to tell you just a little bit about our journey and how we've got through it and to, to pass on that advice. Uh, that, uh, the sign that's there is hanging in my office. My deputy, Charles, brought me that after uh, we had an NTI notice to improve in our school, and uh, I'll tell you about that. They brought me that sign, and it's in a private place in my office. And I have the mug, I have the coaster, I have everything to match to keep calm. So I'm going to tell you about some of the sort of things that we've had to, de we have to deal with or we've had to deal with over the years. Uh, one of the things has been the playground blows up, uh, which it did. There was a lovely picture there, but I don't know where the picture has gone. But our playground blew up. And, and rather than that being a tragedy, we made it an opportunity. They had to, Debbie, I tell you that they just had to take the, uh, hide the checkbook from the poor man whose company, who owned the company, because I kept getting more and more money out of him. We actually made a profit. Nobody was killed. Um, and there are lots of pictures around somewhere. So, oh, there's the pictures, yes. Um, so every, um, I had a different kind of haircut there, and it wasn't very attractive. Uh, but anyway, we weren't killed, and we made lots of money. So that was just one of those things that you deal with. Um, the, um, sorry, there's my mic, and there it is again. Um, they, they were fined a million pounds, but we'd taken a, at least another million out of them beforehand. Uh, this is probably the, the, the main aspect of the, the Isle of Dogs, first place where the first BNP councillor was elected in 1994. I arrived in 1996, and I've spent years trying to tackle the racism, um, the overt racism, um, over the years. It's been, I, I could talk to you about an hour, for an hour about it, but I haven't got the time. But really, the, the, one of the two days that I haven't wanted to come into school in 17 years was the day when a group of parents, they were leafleting the island to say they were going to come and march in the school the next day. They had no confidence in me as head, and it was all terrible. It wasn't, but that's beside the point. So I had to actually get up the next day, come in, and face. And they arrived. They said they were bringing the newspapers with them, but they only got the East London Advertiser because there was no sex, drugs, or rock and roll involved. But we've had to work really, really hard to make sure that our youngsters have been, you know, were tolerant, were not frightened of differences, and are working together. And I'm very proud to say that within the last couple of months, we've achieved the Equalities Award, we've got an Inclusion Award, and today we've been given the um, Rights Respecting Award, which really brings all, to, all the work that we've done over 17 years together. Um, to bring our, our, our pupils. But that was a very scary time where we had race riots, we had all sorts of terrible things happening, and we had to work together as a staff and as a community uh, to change that. So that was a very scary time, but we got through it. Um, so there was the, some of the things. The weapons of mass destruction were in my cupboard uh, because we had lots of gang warfare and all sorts of those things to do. So I had a nice collection of um, weapons at different points, but again, we dealt with that. The BNP had a big effect, but I'm delighted to say we move them to Dagenham. I'm, I'm very sorry for anybody in Dagenham, but that's where they moved to after they left the Isle of Dogs. They left us away because we weren't going to let them win, and we fought very hard against that. Um, other sorts of things ahead, people dying, teachers dying, pupils dying, and you're the head, and you've got to be the strong one. You have to be there to lead the school. Um, in, in my time, Four teachers died, one committed suicide, which is probably the most horrific thing I've ever had to deal with, and that was very difficult to explain to everybody what had happened. We've had six pupils die, and the head has to hold everybody together. And I'm a sort of an emotional person. I'll cry at the drop of a hat, and I did, because I think as a head teacher, you have to be yourself, you have to cry along with everybody else, and you have to uh, feel their pain. So that's one of the things that's actually going to happen if you're a head teacher, and people will look to you to, to lead in that sort of situation. Um, notice to improve. 2008, two weeks after the term began, 
And two of my two new deputy heads, one's still sitting there, had just arrived, God bless them, two weeks in the door. We had a notice to improve, which you think your whole life is going to end. Didn't end. We got through it. We moved forward. We've just been judged a good school. But it was tough. And, as, you know, the next day was the one of the, the second day I didn't want to come into school. So I got myself out of bed, came in, and as a staff and as pupils, everybody, we came together. We pulled our socks on and we moved on. Um, so there's Ofsted. Sorry, this is... I forget what's on here. I'm not going to go into the time because I've only got six minutes. Anyway, we got through that. How many minutes have I got? Oh, God, no. All right. Personal tragedy. I had my own uh, issues to deal with. My, son, uh, my husband was very ill. He's fine now, but the staff have to bring everybody together. And there's all the hints I was going to tell you. Where are they? And how to cope with it all. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's, I blame the ICT, so it can't throw anything at me. Ash cloud delay. I got stuck in New York for three weeks. How terrible was that? <laughs> the, school, the school went on without me and Charles, and Head of English, and all the rest of it. So if I can just get the, we had a lovely time, but anyway. So all of the things there, it's all about your principles and values. If you really believe in what you're doing, you can get through it. And we really believe. So I'll leave you with that one. So, Thank you. Six minutes goes. It's tight, isn't it? It's tight. Oh, it's so, so we've had that, we've had a curve, haven't we? We've had James on a high, then Alex, seven years in and now Kenny at the end, 17. So I think 17 years as head is pretty admirable. So can we give her another round of applause, folks? <laughs> I like the fact that, that Kenny put the caveat of, I haven't been sacked yet, as if, as if someone would be that cruel. There's still time, you're right, seven weeks. So uh, look out. Um, next up is Jude, uh, who's going to talk on something. The green paper. There we are. If you stand up. Good evening. My name is Judith Enright, at Jude Enright on Twitter. I'm Deputy Head for Learning and Teaching at Greenford High School in West London. And for five weeks, I was interim Senko at my school in February. Could you just put your hand up, please, if you've been a Senko? One person, thank you. Could you put your hand up if you would say you have some real expertise on special educational needs? All right. <laughs> I think we need this talk this evening, and I am Miranda, can offer some great services to all of us here. We have, heading towards us, this small meteorite of May 2014, when what is currently a green paper, going through Parliament, will become law. And whilst there are pathfinders out there, there are quite a lot of things that we know are going to change. And what I recommend you all do when you get back into school tomorrow is take a long, hard look into your Senko guide, appreciate how very likely they are to be on the edge of a quite a serious breakdown if they haven't already broken down and say look from Monday you're going to have a week off and from Monday you are going to become the Senko because that's exactly what happened to me February half term when I got a little email from my interim Senko our other Senko had left saying sorry can't carry on so I was Senko um, for a very short time and now a real expert in this whole area who are children with special education or needs you probably know this much they're children learners of a compulsory school age who have a significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of others the same age. And that's in the draft code of practice which is currently out there. And what I'm saying to you is you really need to put SEN under a lens if you want your school to be outstanding. Leadership. Can you put your hand up, please, if your school has found it difficult to recruit a good Senko? Right. So there's a lot more um, agreement there. So I am going to argue a few things here. ICT and SEN are quite similar. I used to be a head of ICT, and what I discovered there is you go to a network manager, and they have a whole load of expertise, which actually, when you sort of unpick it, really isn't that expert at all, and you're just trying to solve problems. It's just the same with an SEN. I have no expertise at all uh, after February half term, but behind all of this, all of these things like dyslexia, autism, educational psychologists, annual reviews, there's just a group of children who need to be better taught. So you need a Senko and you need a Deputy Senko. How are you going to do this? Well, here's another parallel with ICT. You may recognise the situation in your schools. Back in the day, teachers who couldn't quite control their classes were sort of shunted off to teach ICT, because it was great, because those kids sat in front of the computer didn't really have to teach them anything. And it's a bit the same with SEN. Your teachers who necessarily couldn't teach that well, when data made it apparent that some teachers weren't doing so well with their classes, well, they got off to work one-to-one. -one. 
with some of our media students. Well, you've got to turn that around. We're turning that around. We're bringing our best teachers in. We're training them up to teach our autistic students, our dyslexic students. What you do by doing that, by the way, is you're also building up your SENCOs of the future. Needs. I have spent a long time unpicking what really are the needs of some, gosh, how many is it? It's about 20% uh, of our cohort of 1,800. So that's a lot of kids, um, sort of, or 10% of the 180, 360 kids we have on our special educational needs register. But actually, they are just kids who need to be well taught. Quality teaching first. Get all your teachers trained up to meet those needs. All of these children are going to have, sorry, not all of them, only 2% of children will qualify from May 2014 for an education health and care plan. Your statements will get that money, but in primary schools, you'll start to see that kids who previously would have got a lot of extra funding won't anymore. We're going to drop down from a situation where we have maybe sort of 5 to 10% of kids with a statement down to 2%. And these will be children with complex needs. You won't have school action, you won't have school action plus anymore, you'll have a single school-based category. And your local authority, put your hand up if your local authority already told you about your local offer. <laughs> One, right. We have to have a local offer. Go to your local authority and demand what is our local offer. You need to have it ready by this time next year. You need to be working together, academies, free schools, um, maintained schools, whoever you are, you need to be working together to sort out your local offer. Staffing. You need an administrator. Our interim SENCO, who did a very creditable five weeks, um, pointed out to me that actually if your SENCO moves on, it's not such a problem if your administrator is still in place. Get decent administration. So many SENCOs are just being an administrator. Within LAs, they're saying they're going to have trained key workers because parents are going to have the money on the education health and care plan, and they will have the money, um, and these key workers will, you know, help them spend it. I, in my LA, know when people talking about this, I don't trust them. You need higher level teaching assistance, these tried and tested interventions like Every Child Counts, Every Child a Reader, where your LA can provide training for you in these, shouldn't be being taught by highly qualified English teachers, get your teaching assistants teaching and working alongside the teacher. But other than that, you probably have some TAs knocking around and actually bringing down lesson grades in your school. I, I'm all about quality of teaching. I came at this originally just from the point of view of teachers teaching better. And if you've got an adult standing there who's spreading misconceptions, then you're completely destroying the quality of the lessons. So we are no longer going to appoint TAs, we're appointing instead family workers. People to help the parents of the autistic 13-year-old who's had a diagnosis for four years understand what that really means. Impact. You need to know what you are doing, what effect what you're doing has. Your provision map, you need to show cost, impact of everything you do, and you also are going to have to include the fee for premium within all of this. Our LEA are telling us that we are going to have to account for all our delegated funding, which apparently for us is £967,142. And my final point is, this is my niece, and about three or four weeks after she was born, I rang her mother, I must have been the tenth person that day to say, will she ever be able to walk? And my sister-in-law said to me, we've worked out with Katie, it's not going to be about what she can't do, it's going to be about what she can do. And I want you to go back to your schools and work out what your special educational needs children can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. Uh, I'm up next. Blue. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about uh, SLT Dropbox. Um, just out of interest, how many of you have got Dropbox on your computers? Ah, easy. Well, there it is. Off you go. Um, no, I'm going to explain uh, what, what the thinking is behind it. Um, but I'm going to start off by telling you about my background and the sort of person I am. I've got three brothers. Um, one younger and two older, and like me, they're very tall and athletic. And uh, they've got three, they had three bedrooms, obviously, um, as we're growing up, uh, one of whom uh, ran his own mobile discos. He had lots of disco equipment. One of whom had, he, my younger brother, had loads of toys in his room. And the third brother was very, very private, kept himself to himself, was very discreet, and had lots of secrets. Which room do you think I wanted to go into the most? The secret room, because there's nothing more irresistible than actually not knowing what's behind that door, isn't there? Um, and uh, I became quite a pain, actually, uh, and have continued to be quite a pain, uh, because there's a temptation and a desire to find out more uh, that you're not exposed to, and not allowed to be exposed to. And it's the same with computers. Uh, I've got lots and lots of files on my computers, and I'm very, very precious about them, because they're my things, and they're things that I've created. Um, and I was working on something recently, and I thought that this was actually madness, because it was a generic policy. 
uh, that I had to produce, and I was thinking about the number of schools that there are in the country where one person on their own in their silo was creating the same policy, uh, writing the same thing, and the amount of man hours just didn't make sense and didn't add up. And then I thought about the computers that I would like to have access to. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was an aspirational uh, head or a deputy head like me who'd already got that and I had access to their computer and they said, share, what, what, share with what you want and, and take what you want from it. Um, just give me credit, please. Uh, and I tried this out on Twitter and just said, is anyone interested in joining an SLT Dropbox, which is a shared folder with just maybe three of your best resources? Uh, and by resources, it could be an assembly, it could be uh, a policy, it could be a lesson plan, a learning walk, an observation, some thoughts, anything. And the response was massive, absolutely massive. Uh, the idea of SLT sharing things, we can be uh, fortresses and we can keep our documents a, a, as a bastion, if you like. Um, but actually, the people that were sharing things were sharing great stuff. It takes a lot to actually share something with the, the whole world, as it were. And so people were giving their very best things. If you think about the number of folders that you've got on your computer, the fact that you want to share something with it shows that you've got some pride in it, that you want it to get out there, and that someone else wants to use it. Um, so this was three weeks ago I set this up. We've now got 180 members joining this Dropbox. It's non-commercial, so it's only SLT. Working SLT, or even aspiring SLT, have access to this Dropbox folder and they put three items in. And the encouragement is to put three items in. And I haven't even had chance yet to send out an email saying, have you put all your items in yet? Um, when I came up with this idea, my wife was really grateful, because she said, it's a good idea to start something else, Stephen, with uh, seven children and a full-time job. But actually, that's the point, isn't it? I haven't got seven children, it's okay, it's just four. Um, the point is that we are time-starved, and if someone has written a document that can save us one hour, then imagine what we could do with 200 hours saved. Um, and, and it's been amazing to watch this organically grow because people have folders and, and people started at the start tweeting, can I add this folder and include this thing? And actually people don't bother asking anymore, which is fantastic because it's all of our folders uh, and people are adding folders that they feel are necessary and files that they feel are useful and other people are sharing them. Um, there's one more slide, I think. Well. Anyway, uh, if, if I can get that last slide up, uh, please join us. Um, the portmanteau of share revolution is hideous, I know, but I quite like the fact that... Anyway, uh, please join us. It's free to join. All you're saying is, I'm adding this, um, I'm joining this folder as a shared folder, and, and I'm happy to share one or two or three resources, and I don't mind if you use it, I don't mind if you change it and fork it, but just please give me credit if possible. Um, that's my Twitter name. And if you, I've discovered with bit.ly, you have to have capital letters and lowercase. It's bit.ly forward slash teaching dropboxes. Um, when I started, there was a modern foreign languages dropbox. And since the SLT one has started, we've now got an ICT one, a PE one has started up, a maths one. So this is, the, if, if I'm honest, this is the one thing that you could take back to your SLT tomorrow or a curriculum meeting tomorrow and say to your maths coordinator, go here, sign up because people are happy to share resources. We've got almost every single subject covered. The only plea I would say is, if you're primary, please push this, because it seems to be very, very um, senior school-led at the moment, and I'm, I'm primary-based. Uh, so it'd be lovely to see more primary-based uh, people sharing resources and ideas. But there's loads of subjects on there, and loads of people sharing things freely. So please join us. Um, and that's it. And that's well it. Well done, There Stephen. we go. Okay, round of applause for Stephen. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you're up next. Uh, this is Sarah's second SL Teach Meet, first time presenting. Uh, she spoke at Teach Meet London uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, name is you managed to find a winner for your subscription? Yeah. Shani. Is she in the room or is this a remote prize? Can you, can you call out their Twitter name? Shani2345. It must be a remote one, so we'll contact her later. Uh, and Anna, have you found anyone for your champagne yet? NJW499, congratulations, round of applause. Right. 
Okay, round of applause. Okay, Sarah, you have three minutes. Okay, I'll try. Three minutes is a bit of a push. Um, I'm here today to talk about digital learning. Um, this is something that's uh, really important to me. It's something that I've been lucky enough to uh, have been given to coordinate and have a look at the provision we have in school and try to um, make that a better provision for our staff and for our students in the coming year. Um, and I, although the statement, is it all, uh, the question, is it all we'll ever need, is a bit of a controversial one, I think it's not all we'll ever need, but it, we do all need to make sure that we're connecting with it, that we know what's out there, that's, what's available, and what our students are already using that we perhaps aren't aware of that we could use in the classroom. So I'll just tell you uh, my journey so far. Last summer, I was pretty much clueless, to be quite honest, other than getting kids to create a PowerPoint um, in order to show their sort of research behind a topic. I wasn't really being that adventurous with um, ICT. Um, and then Twitter arrived. Um, and I discovered that this was a huge learning tool. It wasn't just about searching, uh, following Kim Kardashian and various other celebrities. It was actually a really, really wonderful learning tool for me. Um, and I grew as I was using Twitter over the summer, and I started to blog for myself. Uh, the first few, to be quite honest, were a bit rubbish, and that's fine. I haven't deleted them. They're still there, because it's quite nice for me to see the journey that I've been on. Um, and then, happily, I was bought, uh, I had an iPhone already, but I was bought an iPad for Christmas, and then it just went ridiculous. Um, and from then on, I haven't really stopped learning and enjoying what kind of things I can bring into the classroom. Started now to blog with my students, which has been a real learning curve for me. Um, again, when I first started doing it, it wasn't very effective, and now, actually, it's brilliant. It's a great tool for them to share their learning with a wider audience, but also for me to be able to see uh, blogging live in a classroom where I'm able to comment on their comments on the same blog page. They're able to refresh the screen and see one another sharing. That's a brilliant tool. So in my own teaching, these are the things that I was experimenting with. And I felt really comfortable with them and the learning journey that I was going on. And I started to think, what else is going on around the school? Because I know bits and pieces, but I don't really know a lot. And this is what we're having. Uh, every 60 seconds, these are the kind of things that are going on all around the world. And I thought, what's going on all around this school? Nobody's coordinating this. I'm really enjoying it. My students are really learning. And I'm sure there's lots of other great stuff going on around schools, around your school. And if there isn't somebody already coordinating it, and I know in lots of schools there isn't, we need to get somebody doing this because it is a vital tool for their future. Um, and one that if we don't start to utilise, the children are going to overtake us and we need to make sure we're using the great tools that are out there. So some of the things that I've been playing with, and again, I'm not saying you should be using all of these, um, and if you do, great. Um, so Class Dojo is something um, of interest to me. I've just used it a few times. Kids can log on and create their own um, avatars, um, explain everything's a great tool, create your own videos, create a YouTube channel where you can share uh, revision resources. Digital leaders is a great thing for you to bring into your schools, get the kids leading digital learning. I'll, I'll, I will share this so that you can have a look at all those resources. But my key would be choose wisely. Don't make the things that you roll out across your school faddy. Make them useful. Have fun with the new stuff that comes out if you're that way inclined. But for whole school initiatives, make it useful, time-saving and long-lasting. And the last thing I promise, educate them. They need to, you need to make sure that they're using it in a useful way, that they're not just um, using it as something to play, that you're guiding them in how their online presence is perceived outside of the school and their French, friendship environment. Um, thinking about digital literacies and e-safety for, for the future. Far too little time. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> OK, uh, just a reminder, we want to know how you've lost your ego this evening, oh. so you need to include the hashtag, SLTeachMe, and the word ego. Uh, and that's for, uh, we've got two books from Teaching Leaders. The book titles are... Uh, Thinking Aloud. Thinking Aloud on Schooling. Okay. Uh, up next we've got Penny. Penny's got six minutes. We've got about uh, four or five presentations left. We hope to be finished by quarter past eight. Or Russell's going to be very upset and kick us out. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name's Penny Rabiger. Um, I work for an organisation called The Key, which some of you might know. Um, I was an English teacher for about 10 years, and I'm a governor in a primary school. Um, tonight, I'm going to just talk about some of the data that we've managed to glean. So 
Um, we have about 30,000 school leaders that use our service. We answer their questions. And there is a lot of activity that happens on our website. So you can see here, clickety clicking all over the place and we're able to farm from that trends. Um, if you look at our website, you can see different areas of the website and you can see how you school leaders use your brains. So you can see, um, despite the fact that you are all about the pupils and their learning, that takes up quite a small amount of your time and a lot of other issues take up large amounts. Anyway, um, I thought we would look at um, academy school leaders and have a look at whether or not they behave differently from um, school leaders in maintained secondary schools. We know that 60% of um, secondary schools are now academies. Um, so based on the activity on our website, new questions were asked, this is what we're seeing. Um, pupil progress, approaches to raise attainment, approaches to teaching and learning. Um, if we're looking at innovation, and we're looking at autonomy, it's interesting to see, I mean, I don't have any answers from this data that we've gleaned, I'm more about sort of trying to stimulate some questions here, but it's interesting to see that uh, maintained schools seem to be more interested in investing more time in leadership and vision, or, or is it just that academies seem to have more support on that front now that they, if they join through a, uh, a multi-academy trust or a chain that seems to have a kind of ready package for them to slot into? Um, or perhaps this was all discussed thoroughly when people were deciding whether or not to academize. Um, academies seem to be concerned with staffing issues. Um, and cynically, you could say this is a reflection of the step away from keeping to the school teacher's pay and conditions document. Um, although evidence seems to show that most academies actually do keep to um, the SPPCB, as it's called. Who are schools and academies accountable to? So looking at requests for information on our website, um, we can see from this time last year, there's a real sharp decline in interest um, in, in Ofsted. So we saw a real obsession with it uh, in spring 2012, and there seems to be a, a real decline across all types of schools now. Um, accountability to parents. You know, we're asking who schools are, are accountable to. Um, again, are we looking at maintained schools as being more embedded in the local community? Is that a reason why they're more interested in, in parent opinion? Um, or perhaps academies already surveyed the local community to find out you know, whether it would be a good idea to academize and whether they would buy into that. Um, and then the accountability to government. So looking at this, um, I'm just wondering, you know, does it, removing that middle tier um, of the local authority, does that, does that mean that academies now feel under much closer scrutiny from government um, and they're more likely to be more obsessed with uh, league tables and summative assessment? Or perhaps there's just greater competition and determination to progress faster and justify their decision to academize. I thought it would be useful to show some of the questions that we're answering. Um, here are some of the ones that we were asked by academies recently. And here are some of the ones that we were asked by secondary school leaders. And like I say, I'm kind of in the business of just presenting what we're finding and asking some questions. You're the ones who have the real knowledge from your own schools what the truth is and what's going on, what's the story behind those things. And that's it. Thank you very much. Is that right? Jones. Okay. Thank you, Penny. Um, next up is Neil Jones. Neil, where are you? No? You're up here now. Neil, how long have you been ahead for? Five and a half years. 
So you're on the, it's, it's getting there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. I've had the, Starting I've had to the crash. Honeymoon. I've had the honeymoon. <laughs> I've had the honeymoon. That's it. It's downhill from here. Um, but I, I had a clicker. clicker. I'll get my clicker. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a head at uh, an independent prep school, St. Joseph's in the Park um, near uh, Hartford. Um, and we're part of an association, the Independent Association of Prep Schools. And I've got uh, probably two and a half minutes to tell you what we as an association are, are uh, moving forward on um, as far as an initiative is concerned. We've built um, something that we feel is a way of engaging all of our schools. We have 600, more than 600 member schools, mostly in the UK, some abroad, who um, provide uh, an education for um, 150,000 children. Uh, and we've come up with something that we feel uh, is a way of engaging all of our schools in interrogating what they do about the education for their children. Um, we've termed it Education for Social Responsibility. It's built on my um, belief that we need a more just and sustainable future uh, for all of the children that we educate. Uh, and we needed a mechanism to engage all of our independent schools in uh, seeking to find a better way forward that uh, allows the children we educate to play a, an effective part in the world uh, that they will um, inherit. So uh, we've asked our schools to look at what they do in all the components that make up uh, their school with these six um, elements, well-being, rights, responsibility, intelligent behavior, uh, knowledge and opportunity, uh, to really ask themselves some searching questions about how they are preparing their children for the 21st century. It's a fast-moving, uh, constantly changing world. We don't know what that future will hold. And it's been very inspiring to be here. It was inspiring to be at the first SL Teach Meet and another Teach Meet that I've attended. But to hear Tom talk about rainforest thinking uh, and to hear Alex talk about the war from the West um, and to recognize that we are all beginning to address what David Orr, an American writer, termed in the early 90s ecological literacy. How do we understand the systems within which we work, whether they're the natural ones or the human ones, um, the, the rural um, uh, countryside systems, uh, whether it's the natural world, or, or us as a group of teachers uh, and educators. Uh, the SL Teach Meets themselves stand as part of an ecosystem of, of development uh, and growth that um, is becoming much more rich and better understood. Uh, so this is what we are doing. Um, this is me sharing a secret uh, from the independent schools world, from IAPS in particular. And I chair a working group who met yesterday um, to look at ways we can continue to drive this through with our schools. Uh, so that they can understand themselves better and how they're preparing their children for the future. Um, because we know what we want ultimately are influential, valuable and productive, happy children. Um, and you can find a bit more about Education for Social Responsibility there on Storify. Um, and follow me on Twitter at Neil Jones, because I was an early adopter and got my name in there before I had to use any numbers. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, up next, Sarapan. SSA three, SSK three. Six minutes. Six minutes. Uh, one prize, one prize. Just grab me notes. Apologies, uh, not surprises. We need a clicker at the front. Uh, is SPEX Joe in the room? Oh, it's another. You're at the back. We've got a teach and leader book coming your way. Uh, so I'll get your contact details later, and we'll get that in the post to you. Great. So we need some more ego tweets, please. Thank you. Okay, well, minutes. good evening all. My name's uh, Sopuram Gill, deputy head teacher at the Heathman School in Hansa. And my presentation this evening is about leadership. And no doubt amongst the, uh, the wealth of experience we have among, with colleagues here, we've all probably come across a fair share of leadership style. So a little bit of audience participation to start with. We'll start with the letter A and name the leadership style. Any volunteers there? Yep, good, could be. Any other A's? Got in a blank. Yeah, could be. Yeah, absolutely. Authority and leadership style. Yes. On to B. And I actually think Wright here was quite forward thinking. Name the leadership style. Begins with B. Not quite. I mean, I had a bit of a chuckle. And believe it or not, it's actually 
Ambassador Leadership. I mean, I just had a bit of a giggle. And I actually had to put the, uh, the citation there. And you can imagine with the um, images, images cro cropping up and as I was wasting my time Sunday morning, it could only be the one and only uh, Mr. Gove. And I'm not saying that Mr. Gove um, has... Uh, um, gone down the wrong route, but he does display some fantastic qualities which uh, display battered leadership. Now, my, my career into teaching uh, began a number of years ago, and I was always keen um, to become a head teacher, uh, and hopefully I'm moving down that right path. And I was asked by a, a head teacher at one of my earlier interviews, well, Mr. Gill, what's your leadership style? And my background is a PE teacher, so very much involved in coaching. And you can imagine the probing question which came on next. Well, actually, are you too nice? Well, no, uh, I said to the panel, actually, I can be a little bit directive if I want to. Well, again, came across the next question. Well, are you going to upset my staff? And I can imagine as the panel sort of glazed over, I drew a blank. It wasn't until about two years ago I embarked on a, an MA in leadership and came across the work of situational leadership, and I firmly uh, recommend uh, a read of, of Percy and Blanchard. And what they actually propose is that there's no best fit leadership style, and actually the most effective leaders delve uh, across a number of leadership styles. So let's put this uh, into context. You're uh, line managing this individual as a head of department, a senior leader, or if you have the, the privilege, as a, as a head teacher. Far too much going on, uh, you're very busy yourself, and you may think it's appropriate in that instance, whilst you have this default system of coaching, to direct this colleague and to come back at a later point, because there's multiple um, priorities need to be juggled. If we go around the continuum, we're actually now we move to a different stage. There's a question being posed there about data, and it might, you might dip into a mentoring style of leadership. Well, actually, the colleague's now developing becoming a lot more confident, and now it might be a little bit of hands-off to move to a coaching leadership style. Well, actually, the colleague now moves forward, and I think this is where we can at times fall into a bit of a pitfall. Whilst we meet with colleagues on a weekly basis, we might have this firm uh, leadership type approach that we use with colleagues throughout, but actually it's appropriate to continue meeting with colleagues despite where they, they sit on the continuum. And appropriately here, particularly with the fourth place, the fourth uh, continuum there, about delegation, this colleague's clearly developed, and it's appropriate to meet with these colleagues to catch them doing the right thing. And I'll, I'll repeat that again. Catch colleagues doing the right thing. It's not about monitoring, it's about support. Situational leadership there is applying the right leadership style to the person in that given context. But there's also pitfalls, and these aren't necessarily in any specific order. The first, as a leader, and I can uh, definitely resonate with this, is choosing status over result. Our roles as leaders, as middle leaders, as senior leaders, isn't just a quick fix, moving students into DPCs. It's that long-term objective, improving the results of every child, and to make sure that's a core purpose of ours. It's important to be liked, but not at the uh, detriment of students, and it's important to hold staff to account, and that's not easy to manage. At the same time, choosing to avoid conflict. And it's not easy to, to challenge that elephant within the room. I mean, I was given some fantastic advice by a former leader in that it's appropriate to have conflict within these four uh, walls within a room. It's important to trust colleagues so that they can air concerns. But as soon as you walk out of those four walls, you stand shoulder to shoulder. And that's great advice I was given very early on. And then most importantly, choosing certainty over taking risk. I mean, how many times have we come across in our own careers? Well, we've always done it this way, and that's why you've ended up with these certain results. And it's brave approaches by colleagues and leaders that I've had the privilege of working with who will take risks to ensure that they drive student achievement for all students within their schools. Why leadership is important to me, I came across uh, this book by uh, Paul Marshall, and it can be uh, displayed in a number of formats, 5A star to see, including this rough, but this looks at the total point score and the inequalities which do exist in some of our schools. And you can see that the difference there between students in free school meals at the, at the tail and the difference there with students who aren't in free school meals. And then the gaps that are materialized over the years. On a finishing point, just to summarize, this is a nice quote I get from uh, Larry Bird. I mean, leadership for me is, is diving for a loose ball. 
It's getting up on a Saturday morning to support colleagues and driving students in for revision sessions. It's getting the crowd involved, teaching those difficult classes. And therefore, it's being able to take it as well when you get decisions wrong and having that trust amongst colleagues for them to approach you and leaving your doors wide open. And that's the only way you're going to get respect from the players. My name's Sapur Gill, and I'm, hope I'm aiming to be a situational leader. Thank you. That was, a, that was a superb masterclass in leadership. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, this is a strange request. Is uh, Denley TSA here, Mr. Squires? Squires. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, guess what? You're up next. <laughs> yeah. uh, next prize. We'll just introduce the next prize. Uh, Chris Hildrew, Ego, congratulations. We'll sort that book out for you. Uh, I'll retweet uh, your tweet that won the prize. Well done. Can we have a round of applause for prizes and sponsors? Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, following on from a previous presentation, um, so that I don't irritate anybody, um, I'm not putting on a show because I literally wrote this probably half an hour ago. So uh, three minutes should, should be fairly straightforward to fill. What Stephen didn't mention was that all those 180 people that signed up for Dropbox, his, um, his now Dropbox account himself is 3 million gigabytes. Um, and he owns his own cloud like Monkey um, back in the 70s on the TV. So if you see him do this later and, um, and summon a cloud to go home, that's what he'll be doing. Um, I'm Andy Squires, um, director of Denby Teaching School, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the new relationship that the teaching school has provided with the local authority. Um, as many local authorities will have found over the last probably five years, um, they are being pared down massively in terms of their scope, um, their influence, their resource, um, and their personnel in terms of um, impact and working with schools. So what we've found since we became a teaching school two years ago is that we now have a new relationship, a new starting point with our local authority, whereby um, we meet regularly, we talk about how we can work with the local authority to work with our collaborative schools, um, how we can work um, in partnership with schools within our alliance. Um, and this is something that we never particularly did with our local authority previously. Um, the local authorities still maintain the accountability for the achievement of every student, in, in our case, in Milton Keynes. Um, and it's certainly changed the way we work and the dynamic that we work. Um, we've now started um, working on what the National College um, call the Big Six. Um, the Big Six is, is a phraseology that's, um, that's, that's grown impetus over the last year. Um, and the National College, in terms of supporting us through that, pretty much issued us with that, which was um, a blank piece of paper, um, and said, um, you need a local solution for your own, um, for your own situation. Um, look at what's needed um, and come up with a solution that best fits your, your particular authority, your particular group of schools. Um, and that's really difficult. It's very empowering. Um, it can also be, be quite frightening um, as well. So um, we've taken the bull by the horns a little bit. It's my role as director of teaching school three days a week, um, a deputy two days a week on Mondays and Fridays. Um, and I still teach a bit of A-level biology, so I'm looking um, interestingly at the courtship rituals of the ostrich that you've got there. Um, and in between that, um, it's given me a bit of a new lease of life working with colleagues through the teaching school um, platform. What I'll do is I'll just leave you with a quote from Harold Wilson um, and came across this um, not that long ago, but courage um, is the art of no one else knowing that you're scared to death. Um, and I think in terms of teaching school with a blank piece of paper, there are certainly moments when, um, when, when that is there. Um, very quickly then, somebody talked about sweets earlier, Andrew Caffrey. You remember the old advert for teaching? How do they make sweets? Closely followed by what's the difference between dust and fluff? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Ross is, uh, is going to finish off tonight, but I just wanted to give a quick thanks to our techie team of, and I hope I've remembered, Graham Stephen, Jason. and Jason Hi. and Leon, who have been, is, is that right? Fantastic. Who have been sorting out all the AV and the sounds and have hung around. They've been here for three days solid preparing for this event. So can we give them an enormous round of applause, please? 
And over to you, Ross. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I've planned far too much, so I'm going to ramble. Apologise. I'll put it, my presentation online for everyone to see. Uh, I've got a few things I want to just go through with everyone. A, a common problem. I'm hoping that I could possibly s uh, save head teachers some money, uh, possibly start a small revolution. Uh, so I'm talking about the interview process, job hunting. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sure you know what I'm up to. Uh, what I perceive as positive factors about the teacher recruitment process at the moment are listed there. So to save time, I won't go through them all at all now. But essentially, there's a, you know, TES is essentially the place that we go to find teaching jobs. In my opinion, the negative factors, I think the application process is defragmented. It's a bit clumsy, different forms to fill in, different types of uh, lengths of deadlines, two-day interviews. Had teachers in the room tell me what the value is of an in-tray exercise, because so far I've never been given any feedback for it. Uh, so the process, the interpretation of the process as well, uh, for the person attending the interview. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to get you to do a little interactive uh, session. So uh, who decides on the interview process? What part of the day should be the most challenging? When is not a good time to hold an interview? How do you inform the candidates before and after? And where do you conduct the interviews? So, uh, some physical ups and downs. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up, please. Bit of exercise late in the evening, last presentation. OK, so I want you to keep standing if you display the following. So keep standing if you have a job. If you don't have a job, please sit down. OK, so everyone's still standing. Good. Uh, you've ever had an interview? So I'm hoping everyone is still standing. Oh, we've got standing. <laughs> uh, OK. You've had to complete an application form. Okay, so we're all still standing. Keep standing if you've used the TES to find a job. So it might start to get a few seats. Okay, seats on bums, or bums on seats. Just to say, keep standing if you've ever been uh, if you've ever been the interviewer. Okay, so one or two more sitting down. Have you ever accepted an application later? So if you're the interviewer, have you ever accepted an application after the date? Keep standing. Okay. Uh, keep standing if you've ever used another method other than the TES to recruit. Okay. Keep standing if you've ever said no to an applicant and then changed your mind. Okay. Look around. Look who's standing. Uh, take, uh, keep standing if your classroom, so either the interviewer or the interviewee, your classroom practice has not been taken into account as part of that process. Okay. So we've got two or three. Okay, so my experience has involved all of those, but I don't think there's one solution to recruitment. Essentially, we're trying to put people in front of our students. So, scenario. I'm going to whiz through all this because there's loads. A job-seeking uh, teacher in London, so currently me, there's about 450 schools that I could potentially apply to. If I was moving to Northumbria, large area, only 48 schools. So straight away, my chances, either the schools or mine, are reduced by tenfold. Okay? Uh, so filling in vacancies according to the needs is relative for the school as it is for the potential applicant. So some numbers. BFE school census in November 2011, 350 teacher vacancies reported. That's 0.1%. I don't know if I believe that figure. Uh, national statistics, school workforce, according to the DFE, 0.9 million types of teachers, whatever you want to define them as, across England. Uh, those numbers from 2000 to 2011 have increased by 32,000 from 400,000 to 438. Put simply, that's 8% competition or 8% more vacancies created, whatever way you look at it. The Equality Act, I'm just including this simply because it's interesting reading. It shouldn't matter now because gender, age, all those things shouldn't be taken into account. Does your application form still ask for male or female? Does it ask for their date of birth? If so, you're not compliant. Uh, some statistics, so there we go, 73% full-time teachers female, 23 male, 65% head teachers female, 23% under 30, 22% 50 plus. Okay, 53% head teachers fifth year over, and 95% of teachers hold degree qualifications. I'm going to whiz through all these because I've got loads. Stephen, how long have we got left, please? I'm not sure at the moment. Two <laughs> minutes. Let's okay. say two minutes. Um, so just some various bullet points. Uh, so a lot of these problems are regional, as you know, across the world. Uh, so my experience, I've worked with teachers from all areas around the world, New Zealand, Australia, the typical places that we'd assume. But uh, 
some more obscure countries, uh, Romania, uh, China, okay, they're becoming more and more popular with teachers being recruited from overseas. Michael Goves, uh, Michael Gove, sorry, recruited, uh, automatically uh, giving QTS to teachers from uh, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and the US. Some quotes, so one quote from Kenny here in the room, uh, plenty of good teachers in the UK, we don't need to look overseas. So to what extent are school leaders having problems sourcing the right teachers? Okay, so rigorous interview process versus being able to meet that rigorous interview process. Okay, could hinder people. Uh, applications are patchy. Those who are fam unfamiliar with the, pro uh, the process might fall down. Uh, one or two day interviews sometimes make it difficult. And I've got loads of quotes, loads of uh, different statements from different teachers. Difficult to recruit quality. Successful recruitment is a major issue. Virtually impossible, zero applicants. I'm skipping through all these, I'll put it online. So I believe uh, requires improvement, needs to be improved. I'm gonna go through all my quotes to the key point that I wanna get to, where I want to save everyone a bit of money. Okay, I believe that teachers can and schools can now advertise through Twitter. So I seem to be getting quite a lot of uh, messages to retweet schools want to advertise their vacancies. So I'm gonna go through all this. So a call to arms, according to Mr. Lockyer, 5% of people on, on Twitter, that's about 50,000 out of the 0.9 million just in England alone. Uh, grow your own philosophy, teaching leaders, all those different pathways. Uh, so a plea to you. I'm gonna skip that. The future. <laughs> so far too many. Uh, so you might be aware I'm looking for to move up to Scotland. That's 500 miles away. I'm finding it very hard to even get registered, never mind find a job, but we've just started, Steve and I, my Ed Hunt, and it looks to retweet job adverts for schools, job adverts for teachers, me wanting to put out a plea, possibly a gum tree, free advertising, like a dating website, we match schools to teachers. I'm finishing, Stephen. It's all for free, uh, and professional networks, and that's it, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Quite Thank surreal you. having to throw the ostrich at the person who's organising it about something that I encouraged him to start. Anyway, very complicated. Um, it's just, just after eight, and it is, and that's not even a Monday night. I said it was Monday night, didn't I? It's Tuesday night, and you're all here, and you've, you've come out, and that's fantastic. And I hope you've got one or two things to take away for school tomorrow. I hope you've got more than one or two things. And uh, I would say, as a, as a final thing, uh, there's nothing special about any of the people that have spoken tonight that's different from you. So if you do have that one idea and you want to share it, please let us know. We're not, we're not looking for people who are great at speaking or are desperate to speak in front of um, other SLT. It's someone, if, you've got, if you want to share an idea, let us know. We'd love to hear it for the next SLT Teach Meet. Uh, are there any questions? Then let's go to break time. So, uh, yeah, I was, sorry, Ross, go I'm on. Just thank you, we're done. We're done. Even, yes, uh, so I want to thank Stephen. Without him, it wouldn't be possible. Thank you. Uh, all the speakers in the room who have come here tonight, their own free will, spoken for free, everything's for free. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you for turning up. Don't forget your certificates outside of the door. Uh, big thanks to ICT team, the catering team outside, Russell at the back, Optimus for the venue, fantastic. Leon for uh, the live stream. Uh, our sponsors, New, med uh, med new Media, Media Core. <laughs> Apologies, show my homework, teaching leaders and SSAT. And uh, next event, Edinburgh, if you fancy, 12th to the 14th of July, if you want to get away for the weekend. Otherwise, the next one in London will probably be in the autumn term. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening.